You're listening to Innovation for Alpha, where we explore everything at the intersection of healthcare innovation and finance. Through our discussions and interviews, we keep you informed and educated about healthcare innovations, next level venture investing, and everything involving the combination of the two. Well, David, it's a good uh, good start. I want to jump, uh, start jumping into some tactics, and in this next um, set of com- you know questions and the discussion, let's talk about time because much of this comes back to time management, and it's not necessarily just brute force. I'm going to have a some clock. You got to approach this systematically, and you talk in the book about you know the things such as hiring and making strategic decisions, implementing core systems there are ways to buy back time, um, but physicians need to make a block of time. Can you talk a little bit about what you recommend in terms of those initial steps to start to control their time? You know, Tobin, it's interesting. uh, In any professional service firm, most the the single big distinction people have about time is billable versus Mm non-billable. So in a medical model, what they'll think is, am I doing procedure or consult time that I can bill for this unit of time or for this grouping of work? And then they think that everything else is less valuable. Mm -hmm. And the irony is, is that's not true. So we have a model based off of Pareto's principle, the 80-20 rule, which says that 80% of what we do creates 20% of the result. It's a very low value, D time. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, some of the admin might be a D-level task, some of the things I have to deal with um, just to keep things going. And then I might think about that 20%, that gives me 80% of the value as C time, and I think about that as procedure time. And I think about that as my consult time that I'm, I'm, I'm billing for. I just had a, you know, I did four consults in, the, in this past hour. I was able to bill, you know, for $115 per consult based on what I was doing. Great. What we have to realize, though, is, is that there's more levels than that. If we take that 80-20 and apply it again, it says that 20% of the 20% gives me 80% of the 80%. And mm. all my physicians out there and dentists are probably saying, oh, that's for every one hour, it's 64 percent of my result that's pretty interesting right they do the math pretty darn quickly and that might be for example different providers that are payers that i use so for example blue cross blue shield might reimburse this procedure at two thousand dollars whereas i might have aetna that reimburses it only for 1500 so by shifting my schedule to take a little bit more blue cross blue shield certainly in the prime periods that's going to go ahead and increase my revenue for the same unit of time by an extra two or three thousand, four thousand, six thousand dollars over the course of a week. Mm-hmm. Multiply that by 50 weeks out of the year, that's a big impact. Yeah. And then if we do it one more time, one more math moment, if I take 20% of the 20% of the 20%, we'll call that A time, that gives me 80% of the 80% of the 80% of the value, which means that that magic 1% gives me half the value. Uh, and it, it's, it's a pretty extraordinary thing. And so, for example, I'll just give one example from a, a medical client that I work with. Um, he, because he freed up a little bit of his time to step back and think, he realized that for him, that he owned, he, he owned several different surgery centers, plus he had some pain management practices, but he also had a hospital. By taking his ambulatory surgery centers, his ASCs, and turning them into hospital outpatient departments, HOPDs, he increased under his contract by close to 30-ish percent the reimbursement for the same procedures Mm -hmm. by the same facility doing the same procedure under a better contract arrangement as an HOPD. The challenge is is that most physicians will never have the time to think this strategically because what they do is they're working 40, 50 hours a week of clinical time, procedural time, And then any other time on the weekend or maybe one day a week they're setting aside, they're spending doing admin and doing a little cursory look at their financials. And even the financial side, they're doing it poorly because they don't have the background. I I had one uh, cosmetic surgery practice we work with, and I remember reviewing their financials. They had broken it down by service lines, the cosmetic procedures. They had a medical spa and these other parts. And I said, do you realize you've told me here that your medical spa is creating all kinds of headaches and hassles. Is that not true? And they said, yes. I mean, it's just, it's a hassle. We think we have to have it because, you know, people come into our high end cosmetic surgery practice. They love it. I said, that's interesting. Do you know that you're, you are paying a quarter of a million dollars per year to run your practice, your spa, you're making, you know, seven figures on the surgery, but you're losing a quarter of a million dollars on the spa. And they said, what do you mean? I said, look right here in your financials. 
Do you notice this number that's in parentheses? That means it's a negative number. They just never had taken the time to see that and they didn't have the fluency. Mm. So they just scanned and saw, okay, we made you know over a million dollars this year, we're happy. Well, they weren't not just making money, they were paying for the headaches for it. They closed that down, they made an extra quarter of a million dollars and their life was better. Mm. These are the things you can only do if you have blocks of some time each week to think, to step back and be strategic. That uh, makes a lot of sense. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, in a bit about teamwork because you know that fluency that you were able to identify may not necessarily come naturally to them at first. But let's talk about you have a, a concept that you call the four D's: delegate, delete, defer, design it out. Talk a little bit about you know as they approach their time and they're trying to figure out how to get some of this off their back there is a systematic way and that's what i, I get that's uh, probably where you're going with that formula is that right that's right so the first step for them is to to ask themselves how can i get rid of more of my d activities because that's where the most of them are and that's the lowest stakes the least value created and so i look at who in my office can i hand off to delegate what can i just not do just accept that it's not going to get done delete what can I just defer, put off to later, or even better, how can I design out? Like, I'll give an example. You know, when you look at how they do their, even their clinical work, you know, one of the family practices we had worked with, um, it was interesting to me, they had a large footprint physically. So in certain corners there, the Wi-Fi was low. And you say, well, what does that matter? Well, when you add it up the time, they lost about one consult for three or four providers, nurse practitioner and or physician in this place every single day, <laughs> every single day. Now this is a group that had over 20 offices. So you can multiply that out. That's extraordinarily a lot of money that all they had to do to fix that two Wi-Fi extenders. That's designing out the problem to give yourself back more time. It's not, it's not dealing with it. It's saying, how do we keep this from ever happening to begin with? And, and I'll give one more concept here. We call it a focus day. So most physician owners take a day or a half a day to do, quote, the admin. The <laughs> fact that they call it admin just makes my stomach churn. It just, it, instead, what I would say on your, on your day that you're going to do non-clinical, non-procedural work or your half day, give yourself a two-hour block, just two hours. Put it out there when you're at your best. For most physicians, you know, it's your, your 7, 30, 8, 9 o'clock in the morning till 11, right? That, that first block. And during that time, you're not going to do admin. You're going to do your A and B level stuff, which is the strategic work on the practice. Mm -hmm. And then the balance of the day, you can do your admin, handing off more to your practice manager, handing off more to your physician liaisons, handing off more to your front desk staff. But for two hours, you're going to give yourself a chance to actually step back and do higher order things, which I'm sure we'll talk about later what those things might be. Yeah, that's great. And you don't use the term, but you're using all the same concepts. You have some different nomenclature of OKRs, objectives and key results, or a quarterly plan. Can you talk a little bit about that idea of a quarterly plan? So now I'm taking some time. I'm thinking strategically. I'm not going to be in reactive mode all the time. What does that look like to have a quarterly plan? Yeah. So the first step I'm going to do is I'm going to ask, in my practice, what's the single biggest limiting factor, capital L, capital F, the one constraint that's my biggest constraint to growth of the practice? And in, in a medical group, it's almost always one of two things. It's almost always going to be I need more patient volume or I need more capacity. Generally, capacity is 80% of the time that's because I need more providers, mid and or physicians, mm -hmm. or um, it might be that I'm needing to have certain type of um, front or back of office staff. For example, you know, there's a, an orthopedic group that is struggling right now, we know, to find schedulers. That's their big deal. They get a lot of referrals, but if they can't get them scheduled within 48 hours of the referral, that referral gets given to a different orthopedic practice and it hurts that relationship. Well, they can't schedule more because they don't have the people. Mm. So I put my finger on what's the single biggest point of uh, constraint to growth. And once I have that, now I do a sweet spot analysis. And simple technique we talk about in Grow Your Medical Practice and Get Your Life Back, but it works like this. I, I brainstorm for 10, 20 minutes, what are all the ideas I have to push back that limiting factor? You know, if it's um, patient volume, what are all my different ideas to increase referrals, to increase patient volume? Can I, like, for example, one of the GI practices we work with, they do obviously a lot of colonoscopies. Well, when someone comes in and they're someone that looks like the person driving them in is over you know, 50, they remind them that, hey, this is important for you too. They call it their friends and families program. That increased their volume by 20% just by implementing that simple system with that. 
Hmm. And they're helping their community. I mean, they find, they track how many precancerous polyps have we found. These are people's lives we're saving um, with that. So I put my, 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 my number one limiting factor on the, the spotlight. I brainstorm all these ideas and I put them through two filters. Hmm. One pass through saying, which of these are low hanging fruit? Easy to do, high likelihood of producing a result. Mm -hmm. Second separate pass, which of these are home runs? If it works, we'll have a big impact. And out of those 15 different ideas, you're going to probably have one, two, or three that are both low hanging and home runs. Those are the ones I do first. And when I do that, now my next step is I'm going to create an action plan. And an action plan starts as simple as one focus area. Later on, you'll probably have two or three. And the good news is for the physician, he or she probably doesn't own any of these steps. They just mm -hmm. need to decide, and we're going to hand off to their staff. We've learned with dental or medical groups that the, the owner physician should be involved to create strategy, but their team should be the one involved with execution and accountability. Mm. And, and that gets a much better result. And we narrow this down to a one page plan of action every quarter. So this rolling series of a 90 day sprint, what's the focus area, one, two, maybe three focus areas. What's the detailed criteria of success, the, the things that actually have to happen for the group to feel successful in this focus area this quarter in their practice, and then the main action steps and milestones with who does what by when. And that simple one-page format, it's in the book, allows you to quickly and easily each week or every other week check in with your practice manager, check in with your the person in charge of your physician referral systems or your marketing, and, and check in with her and say, hey, how are we doing? We said by this point, these things would be done. I just want to hear from you. How's it going? Mm. And that simple shift takes maybe over the course of an entire quarter, 10, 15 hours of physician time over the quarter can radically revolutionize the business. That's how a business person would approach a medical practice. And this is why it gives you a huge competitive advantage relative to the other physicians that are just practicing medicine and not thinking business. There's another half of that, that coin that's very challenging for all business folks, including physicians. And that is, as you mentioned, you start to spend a little bit of strategic time. Let's say you've listed out, you think, all right, this is time to get my practice healthy. I've got 15 things I want to nail. And what you're saying, and it goes back to your earlier principle, you've got to be willing to give yourself permission to say, you know what, I'm going to defer 14 of those or 13 of those. And I've got a plan to figure out which one or two, as you indicate, and I'm just going to punt on some of those things. And I have to be okay with that because the irony is you may be thinking to yourself, you know what, this is the quarter. I'm really going to buckle down. I'm going to work some extra hours. We're going to knock out six of these things. It just never really works that way. Does it? It doesn't. And, and, and a physician should get this intuitively. If I have a patient that comes to me and he smokes, he's morbidly obese uh, and he's got a massive bleeding problem going on right now. Which am I going to adjust? I'm not going to worry about the smoking nor the, the weight. I'm going to deal <laughs> with the bleeding uh, or, or the fact that he's not breathing. And, and so we triage. We do that all the time in medicine. And in the business world, we know that less that we actually get done and into work performing for you is much better than a lot that we start but never finish. And so we, we call it the fewer better principle, the idea that less is a lot more when the less matters more and actually gets done. I love it. And let's wrap up this section with just that concept. And I'm, I'm wondering if you um, leverage this from Stephen Covey. I love, I've always loved this as one of his key concepts, and that is of big rocks and little rocks. And I remember going to, this is, you know, 20 some odd years ago to a Covey workshop where they showed a, you know, a glass that had, it was filled with sand and they asked you to stuff rocks into this glass. And of course you can't do that because the sand is immovable. And then the, the cool experiment is you dump out the sand, you put the rocks in first and then pour the sand over and magically it all fits into the glass. And that, that just stuck, has stuck with me for decades that this idea of what are my big rocks? Talk a little bit about the, the big rock report and how this applies to everything you just talked about. Yeah, I mean, most people, ha and by the way, did for sure come from Dr. Dr. Covey, his idea. I actually interviewed his co-author, Roger Merrill, 26 years ago at the very wow. start of getting going, doing this business stuff. And he was so gracious with his time. His book, First Things First, just, just impacted me. Very cool. But the idea is this. We have this to-do list, and the to-do list might go for pages and pages. There's no way we're going to get all that stuff done. We, we should never 
try to approach our time as if we can get it all done. What we should approach our time is to say, how do I pull my most important one or two things off of that list and put them visually separately that says this week, forgetting everything else that needs to get done, these one or two things will create the most value for my practice. And if I do these things, which might only take me an hour or two or three, everything else is gravy that I do. We call those big rocks, these things that take less than two hours to do. And every week I look at all the things I could do. I look at my action plan of things I'm trying to get done. And I pick the one or two big rocks for the week. And then at the end of the week, I close the loop on how I did. Now we do it with coaching clients where they'll also share their top victories, any challenges and other updates. And they have their key staff members doing this as an app-based thing each week. And what it lets us do is it lets us have a one-page printout for each of our key direct reports of what they consider most important and how they did, what they were their victories so we can encourage them about that, what were their challenges so we could help them with that, and then what do they choose as their big rocks for the next week. It's just a simple discipline. It takes five, 10 minutes to do each week, but it qualitatively upgrades my use of time because now I know visually what can I do with my A time. My, my two hour focus block, it's one of those things, maybe two, that's it. Love it. See you again soon for the next episode of Innovation for Alpha. Make sure to go to Innovation for Alpha for access to prior episode links, show notes, and other valuable resources. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any investment decisions, please consult with a professional. This show is copyrighted by Angel Indie Media, and written permission must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting.